guys, welcome to 101 Ways to Win or Lose Game of Chess. I am your host, Onyx Chess. Today, we're going to look at the difference between E4 versus D4 openings. Let's just look at some E4 openings to start off. This is a simple Ruy Lopez, been seen a million times, and we see four points of pawn contact between the pawns. That's to say that there's only four pawns that can move that's going to attack the opponent's pawn here in this E4 system. Another example is a French, in this case, a Monte Carlo variation. We wind up with four points of tension between the pawns where only four pawn moves can create contact with opposition pawns. Another E4 opening here, very typical. Again, French advance variation, three points of contact. Looking further, we see in the Sicilian, three points of contact. Again, here in the Italian Gioco Pianissimo, four points of contact between the pawns. And here in this Karokan, advanced exchange pardon me exchange variation we see simply two points of contact and that's just to be noted file that away for a minute and let's look at the difference between d4 openings again d4 opening right out the jump already is queens in the defense We're looking at six points of pawn tension here where a pawn can move and create contact with opposition pawns so already we're looking at a lot more complications a lot more to do a lot more tactical variations in in, in matters like that again here in this d4 here Queen's Gambit. Now we're looking at six points of tension. Now look back here to this Monte Carlo, and we're noticing the same three pawns perched in the center. It's the exact same pawn structure as we see here, but in this case, we've got our pawns still on the board here on the e2, e7 squares, and so that's providing two additional points of tension. That's the difference between d4 and e4s. One is typically high tension. One is typically low tension. That's not always. There's D4 that are quite simple. And there's E4 that are quite complex. We'll look at some of that later. But typically what we find be the difference between D4 E4 systems is that there's just a little bit more pawn structure politics going on. We were looking at D4 systems. Here in this Grunfeld, a uh, very common kind of a pawn structure motif. Again, six points of contact going on here. And here in the semi Slav, this was a very this is a very common variation. I just looked through the uh, openings explorer and, and, and played out some of the most played moves. This is where we wound up, and we just get started already. I mean, this is insane. All right, so what's the point? Why are we talking about this? Who cares? What's the difference? Blah blah blah. Chess is chess. Well, you know, chess is chess. It really is, and that's a good point to actually make. But what we're talking about here is tension, and when we're looking at the difference between e4 and d4, while Peace tension will always be peace tension. It seems that in these pawn structure, you know, highly intense pawn structures where there's a lot of things going on in these D4 kinds of positions, it's something to be noted. Is that a strength? Is that a weakness? Let me ask you something. Do you find that you often win games because your opponent overlooked something that you manufactured into the pawn structure? Are you finding that that's a strength for you? Are you finding that you're not losing games when your opponent puts stuff into the pawn structure, but you find most of it? And as such, you usually end up okay or better. If, if you're finding that you're a pawn structure, you know, connoisseur, if you're finding that you're proficient with the pawn structures, then a high tension pawn structure is going to be to your advantage. That's usually going to meet and play like a D, try D4. Try it out and see how you do. Because to people that don't really like pawn structure politics, it's it's a nightmare. They, they it's I mean they might you know be very well versed at how to calculate a sharp position where there's lots of piece trades and I'll trade here, you'll trade there, okay, da, 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 trade the bishop and the knight. Oh, okay, I'll stand better. I'll be okay. I'll do that. Yeah, let's do that. You know, and they might be very good at that. But if they're not appreciating what happens if a pawn moves, if a pawn doesn't move. If a pawn takes, if a pawn doesn't take, if a pawn moves past, etc. Yeah, you're going to have a very, very strong advantage over those kinds of players. All right. And so that's where the discussion between E4 and D4 is actually turning valuable. Now it's not just a simple little debate about, uh, you know, what's better, what style you got. No, let's be very specific. If you're in the mood for something more complicated, definitely check out d4 but i'm gonna change it up i don't want to say d4 anymore i'm just gonna say high tension here's why this is an e4 game right here 
this star nose is, is a Sicilian, but it's a closed Sicilian. So instead of going the typical variation where we see something like this and something like that, something like that, something like that, something like that, something like that and there's three points of tension, instead here in this Sicilian, we play E4, then D3. And after D3, we see that this actually turns into a D4-esque kind of opening. This is a high tension opening. This is pawn structure politics to a maximum. We see nine points of tension right out the gate in this variation. All right, so while this is an E4 opening, you may as well call it a D4 Sicilian because I'm probably not the only one who would know what you're talking about. You must be talking about the closed Sicilian because it plays like a D4. And, I mean, how can we, again, how can we use this? I, I like to see, you know, what works. I, I'm more into what actually works. I like effectiveness. Okay, all right, so already, if you find that you love the pawn structure, of the D4 kinds of openings, of high tension openings. And you also find you like the Sicilian. Let's say you've played Sicilian and you've played tens of thousands of Sicilian games and you know where all the pieces are and you know where they go. Well, this is still comparable. All right, you're gonna have a lot of your pieces on the same kinds of squares through most of the game. However, you're gonna have that added benefit of, you know, adding pawn structure complications to the position you're gonna what you couldn't do in an e4 because there's only a very limited amount of tension that you can provide and manipulate you see so here you can bake in all kinds of complications into this sicilian that you couldn't do in any other one you understand so this is how we can say like yeah if i if i feel i'm talented at, at pawn structure hey let me let me look at that that little close sicilian there and see if i've maybe been playing that sicilian the wrong way all these years you see, you might do very, very, very well. You understand further? It's not very common at all. So you're going to be taking everybody out of book. Totally and completely out of book. For the most part. You understand? So that's another big advantage. Of course, it's not without cost. All right. Once you play E4 and you play D3, you, resi you, you, are, you are actually, yeah, you, you're resigning a lot of advantages there that you would normally get playing D4 in one go. So once you play D3, hey, know what you're getting into. You understand? You, 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 you're giving up, you know, a, a fundamental advantage when you play that. You know, not only just a, a telegraphing the, the development of the bishop, not only stymieing the development of the bishop, not only giving up space in the center, but it all, it's just allowing space in this. It's just yuck. It's, it's yuck. Okay. So I don't recommend it if it's not to your taste and it's not to your specific skill set. On the other hand, like I say, hey, if you're a Sicilian connoisseur and you're a pawn structure politics connoisseur, this is the one for you. Check it out, see what happens, you understand? But again, we're talking about tension and so we're finding value-added information when we're looking at the conversation from a very specific and very effective kind of a way. We wanna look at what stuff does and how can I apply that to best effect to my own strengths and my own weaknesses. And now we have a basis for that answering that question on on the basis of, of discussing this under the umbrella of, of tension instead of just ambiguous yeah you understand it's subjective kind of you know non-concrete kind of you know you know banter or what have you but this is what we're talking about here so uh, that's gonna be part one to this but we're gonna go into part two right away and we're gonna talk about tension in general so James Mason in 1897 said a threat or menace of exchange or of occupation of some important point is often far more effective than its actual execution now was he the first to say it no he was the first to say it in English and have it written down on paper but before him was Carl Eisenbach who died in 19 uh, pardon me, 1894. So three years prior to this being credited to Mr. Mason, Karl Eisenbach had already said, Die Drohung ist oft stärker als die Ausführung, which means the threat is often stronger than carrying it out. So again, uh, it's definitely Mr. Eisenbach that said it first, uh, who's to be credited for having had said it first, but there's no telling which person in the 6th century, 7th century, 8th century may have said this or thought it or said that to it. Who knows? You, know, you understand. But certainly, 
It's certainly not Tartakar. It's certainly not Nimzovich. These are not the people that actually are credited for saying it first. If you want to talk intelligently, you're going to talk about Mr. Mason and you're going to talk about Mr. Eisenbach as being the two people uh, to whom that statement was first accredited to. But what does it mean? Why is it important? Here's why it's important. In this instance here, we see what I call one-sided tension. One-sided tension occurs when you've got a piece that can attack one piece, but a piece that can't attack that piece back. So in all of this pawn tense that we're talking about, pawn can attack the pawn. And in all instances, it's never one-sided. It's every instance of pawn politics is always two-sided. In this instance, that knight can't attack that bishop. So if that knight can't attack that bishop, but that bishop can attack that knight, that's an advantage for black. You can't tell me otherwise. All right. Further, it's not only tension on the knight. There's extra tension here on the rook. Okay. There's going to be extra tension on b2 for that matter as well. All right. So so white's got to keep pawns defended and make sure pawns don't move unless rooks are going to be, you understand, in, 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 a, in a hurting kind of way. You understand white has a lot of things to worry about with that bishop sitting up there on the g7 square all right this is tension to the max i really can't even think of a better example i mean this is it's just got so it threatens a check don't it i i mean it's it's a big deal that bishop there uh it represents a headache you can call it a headache and this is actually how we pull uh positions right apart in chess this is actually how we win games right here just right here putting that bishop on g7 wins chess games this is why you understand at some point if black can manage to to to, to needle enough of these instances of threat and enough of these instances of okay, you have to watch for this watch for that watch for this watch for that white's gonna get pulled apart you can't defend everything at some point there's gonna be a family fork some kind of a fork a pin there's gonna be a discovery there's gonna be a sacrifice at some point something has to shake loose in white's position black will take space black will take optimal squares White, white just won't be able to hold it and black's gonna break through all right so so this is why we pay close attention uh to the tension because tension wins and loses games period you can't tell me otherwise that must be appreciated when that bishop's sitting there on g7 it does not hurt to take a few minutes to understand exactly what it's doing and what it could do there's nothing wrong with taking a minute to understand that and and changing this not from a simple he hits that knight, then I do this, and that no, but like fully understand. So you're looking at that rook, you're looking at that pawn, you're just understanding fully what that bishop on g7 is capable of. We haven't even began to discuss what happens if it ends up at h6. And for good reason, because probably it's not that big of a deal. That's probably more advantageous for white. But we would want to be looking at that too. We look at everything. All right, so that's tension. That's what it's about. Now, this is between pieces, but. Let's look at the final stage here and to say, say, hey, you know, what's the relevance of it all in the bigger picture? We've talked about pawn tension in the pawn politics, peace tension between pieces. What are we talking about in the big picture? What does tension matter? Here's what it matters. You have to, in every single variation of every single move here as white, understand what happens if black decides to pull the trigger on that knight. All right. So there's no break from that at all. Until that bishop takes that knight and resolves that problem for white, white will have to forever in every variation wonder what happens if bishop takes knight and then bishop's his check and then how will I block that check and what was that piece that I was doing to block that check or whatever you want to choose or move the king. Where's my king now? What's he susceptible to? All kinds of additional problems happen that white has to answer. Okay, now as soon as black takes that knight, all those problems are gone. All right, but this is not to be just relegated to peace on peace tension. It gets the most attention because this is worth three points and this is worth three, well, arguably three and a half and three or whatever the case is. But these are worth points. That's where it gets all the, the attention. But we don't usually speak too much about the pawn tension. And that's what, that's what we're talking about here. Look. Just as much as we have to appreciate what happens every single move. If this bishop hits this knight in every single move, you know what? We're appreciating what happens. What happens if this? What happens if that? What happens if that? What happens if that? If that? If that? If that? If that? If that? 
I'm going to do every one because it's important. It's very important. We have to understand fully what happens not only if bishop takes knight, but we have to understand what happens if any pawn moves. And not only moves, but if any pawn doesn't move. So if it doesn't move, we have to understand what happens then as well. Plain and simple. This can't be overlooked. This can't be overlooked because as important as this tension is here, pawns are the stop plate of the chessboard. And as such, they're going to determine where every single piece is or is not effective. A rook is not a rook. A knight is not a knight. A bishop is not a bishop. These pieces are greatly maximized and minimized depending on where the pawns are placed. I watched a GM play a game uh, early in 2019 and this guy actually had the audacity to trade off both of his rooks, 10 points in rooks, for two pieces of his opponents. That's six points. And he almost went on to win, managed to draw, but just the fact that in that particular pawn structure, it merited trading off both his rooks just for two pieces. Is It's mind-blowing. And it really speaks to the level that these GMs are able to analyze these games on to where they can actually find these kinds of variations where most of us would simply say, what, a rook for a piece? Are you kidding? No, that's, that's just not going to happen. Not today. Surely, that's losing. No, it's not. Not necessarily. There are pawn structures that's going to very much justify exactly that kind of an idea. And that's what you have to look at when you're determining, all right, where should my pieces be? Where should I, if I can keep my opponent's pieces, you know, mitigated to, you know, weak squares, what squares would those be? The pawn structure determines everything. It tells us exactly what our pieces can and can't do. They are the stop plates of the chessboard. And you really have to check out what happens after every single pawn moves. And if a pawn moves, is that to your advantage or your disadvantage? And each pawn move is going to have a tactical calculation, a tactical variation that follows it. That's going to say, go ahead and move that pawn. Because if you move that pawn, then you, you give up, say, defense of a square like f5. I'm going to put a knight there. And if you try to move this pawn up, then my knight's going to do so-so and this and that and this and the other. You understand? Everything's tied in, but it's always the pawns. It's, it's really not the pieces in and of themselves that make them strong. It's how they react in relation to the pawns. And again, this is all about tension. This is, that's, that, that's the definition of the idea I just described. It's called tension. And it's all we're talking about when we talk about D4 versus E4. It's all we're talking. It's I mean, it's it's everything. It's it's a huge part of chess, and it's a word that I think is definitely underused and underappreciated, given how much it has to do with absolutely everything. Good people, thanks for tuning in. This has been Onyx Chess. Until next time, may your pieces find the very best squares.